If you think about driving, it doesn't seem that complicated. You press the go pedal and off you go, forwards. Or I suppose backwards. You see something you need to avoid and you steer around it or you stop. You see an instruction from a traffic signal or a road sign and you follow that direction. Rinse and repeat and Bob's your aunt, you're safely there at your destination. I feel pretty good about this goal is that um, we'll be able to do a, a demonstration drive of full autonomy all the way from LA to New York. So basically from uh, a home in LA to let's say dropping you off in, in Times Square in New York and ha having the car go and park itself uh, by the end of next year without, without, without the need for a single um, touch, including the charger. But it turns out that to do that is incredibly complicated. So today we're going to talk about how autonomous systems and semi-autonomous systems currently work, why Tesla's CEO announced that the next major release of FSD version 11 will work in a very different way to the current version, why that's likely to take a while to get right, and what that means for the future of self-driving. Driving, it turns out, is incredibly complicated. Yes, making a car go forwards, backwards, left and right isn't that difficult. Making it do that and not hit anything, oh, and ideally go the place you want it to, is an intersection of a lot of difficult and complicated things. And as with a lot of concepts in the modern world, there are many options for how you go about it. But at the end of that rainbow, there is the promise that autonomous driving could markedly improve safety. Although I feel it's important to point out, as I do with tedious regularity, that there is currently no evidence that autonomous systems really do make driving safer, which is why we need better data. And from Tesla, there's been a promise since 2019 that your expensive piece of personal transportation will work for you as a robo-taxi when you're not using it, making you some tasty moolah on the side. That's a money for you non-Brits. While simultaneously fixing all the perceived problems of public transportation. Hmm. Self-driving is a concept that's been around nearly as long as we have had cars. Back in the 1920s there were a whole bunch of demonstrations of remote controlled vehicles called, at the time, phantom autos. In the 1950s, GM excitedly portrayed a future in which their gas-turbine-powered futuristic firebird would transport you and yours to your destination at the touch of a button. And Carnegie Mellon University has had NavLab up and autonomously driving since the 1980s. And importantly, one of the main approaches to autonomous driving has remained pretty much the same since then. Its DNA is in the way that Tesla's FSD currently works. It's the way that Waymo, Cruise, and basically nearly all autonomous driving systems work. And that is to divvy the task of driving up into multiple, more manageable chunks. At the very top of the tree, you have something that monitors everything below it to make sure it's all working. Then you have a chunk which does the actual control of the car, sometimes called motion and vehicle control and you have a chunk that tells that bit what it thinks the car should do, often referred to as planning and decision making. And then there's the perception block, and that contains chunks that identify and predict what objects. By objects, I mean anything that isn't the car itself are going to do. And then you have blocks that look at the data coming in from each data source. Typically for cars, that's cameras, radars, and increasingly LiDAR and maybe ultrasonic sensors. The images coming from those sources are then processed through a couple of systems to achieve what's called feature extraction. One part of that is semantic segmentation and the other object detection. If that sounds complex, it is. But at a very basic level, semantic segmentation is looking at each dot that makes up an image and assigning it to the relevant pigeonhole. This pixel is say, a bit of a person, so it goes in the person pigeonhole. This one is a bit of a tree, so it goes in the tree pigeonhole. This one is a bit of a motorbike, and this one is a street sign, and so on and so on. Object detection identifies objects of interest, 
and then draws a box around that object, defining the boundaries of what is and isn't, say, a curb or a crash barrier. Increasingly, we're seeing more complicated models of certain objects of interest, mainly people, because our pose and body language can give you a lot of information about what we're planning to do. Are we stood at the curb waiting to cross, or are we chatting to our friend on the phone and just happen to be stood by the crosswalk? So we're seeing the section of software that deals with the this is a human having to do more complex identification and modeling to allow the algorithms that we're going to be feeding all of that data into to predict with more accuracy what the person it's identified is likely to do. Now, there's a few problems with this approach. Basically, objects are complicated, humans are irrational and don't always follow the rules, sensors detect different things, and there's something that we're going to call the curse of rarity. Let's start at the top. Humans are very good at learning that objects look different from different angles. We're very good at saying, oh, that's an acorn pocketbook too. Even if we say, look at it from a weird angle, our brains are wired to allow us to easily separate and classify objects, and we're pretty good at knowing how those objects, in general, behave. Not only that, but we're also really, really good at using past experiences to generalize use cases outside the one we learned about. So we can look at the box and know that other box-like objects will share some of their behaviors and properties with a generic box. That skill, it turns out, is very difficult to teach to a computer using machine learning. So while we can identify an upside down street sign in a fuzzy capture image, a computer can't reliably do that as well, which is why we use tests like that to test for bots. And that has significant ramifications when you're driving and say the speed limit or low bridge warning sign is mostly obscured by a tree. It also has significant ramifications when say the cyclist is partially obscured by a van. As humans, we're still able to identify that cyclist as a person on a bike, from a very limited amount of data, but that, it turns out, is also something that a computer struggles to do, at least at the moment. Whatever ChatGPT's spicy autocomplete might say in its generative news articles. And another challenge is that humans are not great at following rules. If cars existed in a futuristic utopia, or indeed dystopia, in which the only things sharing the road with computer-controlled cars were other computer-controlled cars, and if those vehicles travelled in lanes that prevented the vehicles interacting with humans, Klingons, or other animals, or other random natural or human ephemera, and definitely didn't have to interact with things piloted by other unreliable skin sacks, then we would probably already be at autonomy. Frankly, we could have been at autonomy back in the 1980s, were that the case. But autonomous cars have to share the road with people. People who occasionally decide that, yeah, I can make that amber light. Or if I floor it, I can make that gap and overtake. Or who have just worked a 12-hour shift, earning minimum wage in a 70-hour work week, and they are so exhausted that they wander across the white line as they're driving home. Autonomous cars have to share the road with that deer that decides half a second before the vehicle is upon them that the right moment to leap out into the road is now. And pressingly, autonomous cars have to share their environment with distracted people and particularly kids who don't necessarily always listen to Dave Prowse. Green cross man! Green crosses! Where do you think you're going, you dumbo? Green cross. Maybe because he's not their father. What's particularly challenging for folks designing and building autonomous cars is that not only do they have to navigate a world in which the things around them don't exactly follow the rules, but legally they have to try and follow the rules, which is why earlier attempts at autonomy sucked in busy city traffic, because if you're always absolutely rigidly following the rules and you're surrounded by vehicles driven by humans that don't, then the autonomous car gets stuck. And no, not stuck like the Cruz and Waymo autonomous vehicles that have randomly got stuck in a variety of intersections and construction zones because their model of the world failed. 
It gets stuck because everyone else will push past, bend those rules and leave it sat at the junction waiting with its blinker on. And then we come to one of the more technical challenges. Sensors detect different things well and don't do so well on other things. That means that you have to try and combine all those inputs using something called sensor fusion. As I said earlier, autonomous vehicles have more than one way of seeing the world. For a while, Tesla and Como were outliers in saying that radar and lidar were both unnecessary and you could get along just fine with only the camera. Now it's unclear if Tesla still plans that long term because last year we saw Tesla file documents indicating that it'd be maybe reintroducing radar having removed it earlier in the year and the Tesla quote Phoenix radar which has a longer range and more rapid response appears to be baked into the hardware for its current iteration of full self-driving which leaves just comma sitting alone in the particular tree of stating that its ambition is for camera only autonomy although it does use radar right now when it's available. So why, when humans mostly rely on vision, might cars need more than that? Well, first, humans don't just rely on vision. There's feel, both of the road and of the car itself. There's smell. <laughs> I, I smell diesel. Maybe this road might be more slippery. There's hearing. What was that sound? Is that a, a siren? Is it up ahead? Maybe I should slow down. On the subject of hearing, Nikki tells me that her late sister, who was profoundly deaf, was a great driver who never had an accident. But because she couldn't use oral cues while driving, found the whole thing more tiring than someone who could hear, because she had to rely so much more on what she could see than most of us do. Our brains use all the available input methods and our sense of proprioception. That's the I know where my body or in this case, the car extends to and is in space. That sense when we drive. Cars with camera only vision are challenged in the dark and in poor weather. They can be sun and rain blinded like humans and depth perception from monocular cameras as are typically used on vehicles is not great. Hence the ongoing concerns about whether Tesla's vision only system can reliably detect the distance to motorcycles. Each type of sensor has strengths and weaknesses. Cameras can, in good weather and bright light, collect the richest information about the environment. They're needed for traffic sign recognition, traffic lights, and a bunch of other object detection applications. LiDAR uses laser emitters and receivers to bounce human invisible light off objects. Using that, it can recognize distance to the object with little regard for light and weather. And the reflections are used to create a point cloud map which accurately pinpoints the distance between the vehicle and an object. And radar senses the approximate distance by emitting a radio signal and bouncing that back to the sensor off objects. While radar works really well regardless of weather conditions and has a much longer range than LiDAR, it's also much less accurate and provides a much less fine-grained view of the world. Now, because LiDAR and radar both can't see colors or symbols if you're going to use one or both, you need to pair them with a camera. Some companies like Volvo are choosing systems that incorporate more of the options, and some companies are picking their favorite one or two. But whichever combo you pick, once you have more than one sensor, you have to merge all those pictures together using sensor fusion. In this case, that's where a vehicle combines all the information from the various sensors and disregards information that's misleading or erroneous, or at least tries to. See, when you're driving up a hill, a drain cover can reflect the radar or lidar signal back to the vehicle. Even an empty crisp packet can cause enough reflection for a vehicle to think that there's a significant object in its planned path, and then it can slam on the anchors, bringing the car to an unceremonious halt which can have disastrous results if the driver isn't fully attentive or the vehicle behind is too close. Phantom braking, as it's called, is something I have experienced with vehicles with level 2 driver assistance systems from every single major brand on the market right now. There's multiple different ways to achieve sensor fusion, and it's a really complicated topic which I'm not going to get into in a great deal of depth. And a lot of people here will point to aircraft where sensor fusion has been around for a very long time. It combines data from gyroscopes, altimeters, navigation systems, and airspeed indicators. And they say, this should be trivial. But 
Aircraft exist in a much simpler environment in many regards, and the landscape of a city has a lot more features and a lot more objects that move in close proximity. Something that aircraft generally try and avoid? Anyhow, at the moment the easiest but least reliable method is to allow each individual sensor to do its version of perception. Basically kind of average it out, weighting the sensors by how much you trust their data. So the camera says there's a person there and so does the lidar, but the radar doesn't. Well, we'll trust that answer and say there's a person there. But if just the lidar says there's a person there and nothing else does, maybe we take a punt on it and we carry on driving. At least until more sensors decide there's something in the way. The other option is that you can try and combine all that data much earlier and use all the complexities of each input to produce a really rich data set from which you can then try and map out your scene. This is inherently way more complicated and requires much more processing power, but it can be vastly more accurate. Additionally, many current semi-autonomous and autonomous systems are reliant on extremely high resolution mapping of the environment. And when I say extremely high accuracy, I'm talking about sub-inch precision. That's often rolled into the perception component as the vehicle tries to locate itself in the world. Obviously the world is not a static object and roads get widened, they get potholed, signs get moved or knocked over, cars hit barriers, buildings get demolished, and each time that happens the map becomes less accurate, and eventually the car can't use that data to identify its location successfully. Anyone who's driven a car equipped with Blue Cruise, ProPilot or Super Cruise, all of which are systems that are reliant on high def maps, will be well aware of the alerts that pop up when the high def map is missing or undergoing maintenance, or just unavailable for the place where you are. Reliance on HD maps is really a temporary fix for a much more complicated challenge. And then finally, there's the curse of rarity. When you're training and building your autonomous vehicle, if it's going to be truly autonomous, it needs to be able to handle emergent situations. It's no good if the first time it experiences a time hole, it doesn't react properly and drives you straight into it. Crichton. It's a time hole! <laughs> I suppose you're going to fail me for this. Instead, it needs to be able to take evasive action. Even if it doesn't know what the threat is, it still needs to be trained on data on safety critical events to enable it to know how to avoid them. But the number of safety critical events in most datasets is very small, and the amount of data they provide is also very small. Each vehicle from which, say, BMW is gathering data may cover tens of thousands of miles without any significant incident. And finding those significant incidents to get the useful data? That's really hard. The data for you swerved and avoided a smidzy, sorry mate, I didn't see you looks much the same as a swerve because the wind caught you off guard, or because you thought someone was going to pull out, but they didn't. Okay, so that's how FSD and Blue Cruise and so on all work right now. So if Tesla is ditching this approach, then why have I spent quite so long explaining how it works? And at the moment, it needs to know how to classify everything it encounters, whatever angles it sees it at, and it needs to be able to make a good stab at how those things behave, and to do that, the way we've worked so far, we basically have to show it every single thing it needs to know about. So if the option that comma.ai and now Tesla are working on isn't discrete chunks doing easily delineated tasks, what is it? It's this. It's a deep learning black box. Into it goes sensor data, and out of it comes driving, which Sounds simplistic, but that is the basic principle. Instead of divvying up driving into hundreds of tiny tasks and solving each one independently, you let the machine work out how to do all of it. You provide it with information on how humans drive. Lots of carefully curated, at least ideally, information. All recorded and extracted from actual humans driving actual cars, or maybe simulated for specific circumstances using some section of real or simulated driving data. Then into that black box you feed all that human driving sensor data. You test it in some model environments and reinforce the learning 
when it does things that we want, like, you know, stopping for stop signs and not mowing down pedestrians, and when you're satisfied it's doing an okay job, you can let it drive a real car, which is basically the way that humans do it. I mean, sure, we get them to sit down and get them to do driver's ed, but basically most of what you learn about driving is done by, well, driving. Now, one problem with this approach is that it's much more opaque. Maybe your autonomous system suddenly decides that it won't turn left if there's a larch tree just before the corner. That might be down to some problem in your data set. Maybe all your no left turn trainings just happen to have a large tree in the corner and the deep learning algorithm picked up on that rather than the presence of the no left turn sign. Maybe it's something else entirely. Another challenge is that algorithmic bias exists in that can show itself in autonomous vehicle data sets. And to make end to end driving a possibility, the quality of the data that goes in has to be spot on as they used to say, garbage in, garbage out. There also remains the increasingly complex question of how you test the functionality of an autonomous vehicle and whether it meets the safety standards that we require for humans. Questions that both Tesla and Comma have basically skirted by getting owners to sign up and say, oh, I'm fine with being part of a test project. The ethics of that are definitely questionable given that no one else on the road that you interact with has agreed to be in your little experiment. And I do say that with near 20,000 miles of comma driving under my belt, so you know that I am deeply hypocritical. But the question of why I suspect that version 11 with completely hands-off level 5 autonomy isn't six months out for FSD? Well, Comma has been working on end-to-end -end autonomy since its founding, and lateral, that is left-to-right control performed by Comma's software, OpenPilot is amazing and incredibly reliable. But engaging the alpha experimental longitudinal mode in which it's doing full end-to-end -end driving is, at the moment, an experience. It's vastly more stressful than driving. In my time overseeing it, it travelled at an incredibly erratic speed, California rolled every single stop sign, and while it does stop for red lights, it also stopped or slowed for a crawl for no apparent reason. Its lane positioning was inconsistent, and, well, I wouldn't yet trust it to drive my cat somewhere. And I don't have a cat. Now, certainly Tesla has a lot more money and a lot more computing power to throw at this problem. It has access to all the vehicle sensors and has a CEO who's willing to push his team to sacrifice everything to get a project over the line. But as we've seen time and time again, the first 80% of this is pretty easy. It's that final 20% where the hard problems lie, and that's the bit that's going to take time. So the future of self-driving, true level 5 autonomy, that's cars doing all the driving and you just sitting and chilling, that is still a ways away. But hopefully we can get some better results on simpler driving tasks in the next few years. And on that note, we're done with today's video. If you have comments, drop us a polite note in the Discord chat room on Mastodon, or if you're a Patreon supporter, you can drop a note in the comments there. If you want more, subscribe, hit the bell, and follow the links below to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or Patreon subscription. You'll also find links to our Ko-fi, Bitcoin, and Swag store, as well as that aforementioned Mastodon server. Scrolling by on my right is our amazing list of charged up supporters and shout outs go to our V2G, Patreon supporters Petro Muro Pinheiro, Alan Tupper, Andrew Martin, Bennett Elder, Brophy Wolf, Chris Maxwell, Cyprian Laplace, Dan Blair, Gordon C. Hay, Esker, John Trammell, Kyle Fox, Mark Eggleton, Peter Dillinger, Regine Fellows, Sean Tucker, Stefan Fremgen, Stephen Williams, Tessa in the Gong, Paul Bricknell, Tony Moss, Kyle Hodgson, Trissa Center, Denny Hyde, Lance Schall, Linda Irish, Mike Weeder, and Paul Nelson. And finally, big thanks to our off-grid supporters, Paul Conway, Kevin Burrowbridge, Stephen O'Donoghue, Jim Burness, Robert Flannery, Aaron Han, Ellery Hensley, Rory Litwin, JP Fagerback, Dave Kitchen, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, Chris and Michael Johnson, Clay Witt, CPU Freak 101, Eric Knack, Joe Bresney, Joe Hughes, John Henderson, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Nigel S, Reggie Watts, Will, Graylin, and of course, Ian. Don't forget we make videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday on the main channel, plus Sunday on Take 2, 
And with that, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you soon. And as always, keep evolving.